Okay, so we should be streaming live now on Facebook. So hello, everyone. Welcome into episode three of our uh, roundtable series here at Urbanitus. We're very excited to welcome in three fantastic guests to discuss the 2020 election in Texas and its aftermath. So this roundtable is not going to feature a typical election analysis. We're not going to be pouring over maps of various shades of, of red and blue. And instead, the goal of this roundtable is to get a sense of how people in their day-to-day -day lives are feeling about and affected by the results of the election. And we really want to assess the needs of our communities in Texas cities that have faced the brunt of our steepest challenges in the past year. So we have three wonderful guests this evening, and they are going to help us gain some important insight as we move into 2021. So before I get into introducing everybody, I just want to point out how this is going to work. So we are live on facebook.com slash and right below the window here, you can see a little share button. So if you go ahead and click that, uh, you can make sure that all your friends can tune into this discussion. Um, and throughout our talk here this evening, please feel free to leave questions and comments below the video, and we'll spend some time towards the end to get to some of the audience questions. Um, so let's get to our guests. Uh, I'm just going to go in order of how people appear on my screen. So if you guys could give the audience your name and some background on who you are and what you're up to. Uh, Carmen and Susana, if you could talk about your organizations that you run. And Brooke, if you could talk a little bit about your research at UT. That would be great. So let's go ahead and start with Brooke. Okay, cool. Hi, my name is Brooke Shannon. I'm a fifth year PhD student in UT's government department. And I study public policy and American politics with an emphasis on urban and local governments in the US. Um, primarily, I study local government agendas. So what the government does, what types of policies it prioritizes, um, both contemporary in contemporary cities, as well as while a, a young city or an early city is urbanizing and developing. So thinking about like what types of policies um, help it develop, what type of policies help it develop like sp into a specific type of city. Awesome. Okay, uh, Carmen, you want to go ahead? Good evening, I'm Carmen Yanis Pulido and uh, I'm a community organizer from Austin, Texas. I uh, uh, serve as executive director of Go Austin, Vamos Austin, which is a nonprofit that does community organizing in Austin's Eastern Crescent uh, to break down barriers to health equity uh, specifically. And um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Susana. Uh, yeah, I'm Susana Almanza. I'm a native of East Austin. I'm also uh, the director of Poder People Organized in Defense of Earth and Her Resources. It's an environmental social justice organization. Uh, but I see myself more as a community organizer. I use the word director because um, that's the way, uh, you know, the institutions want us to, to name ourselves. And we do a variety of work. We, do, we have Lucha Land Use and Community Action where we look at land use, we have transportation and quality of life, where we look at transportation issues and it's not like sidewalks, uh, all kinds of things, lighting and so forth. We have the Young Scholars for Justice where we work with the next generation of youth uh, to bring them and to be involved in the community. And we also have the Nawi Olin Healthy Communities. Uh, it's a Nawi word meaning the four elements and the four directions uh, where we look at alternatives uh, to chemicals. And we basically work on just about all types of issues because we are an environmental justice, social justice organization and the first environmental justice organization in East Austin. And we've been around already for 30 years. Awesome, wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so again, we're gonna talk about the 2020 election in Texas. So just to get us warmed up, let's recap. What happened, as we all know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they won the White House, although they failed to be the first Democratic ticket to take Texas since Jimmy Carter, 1976. Some people were somewhat hopeful of that happening. It did not happen. Uh, MJ Hagar also was unable to win the Senate seat against incumbent John Cornyn. She actually ran behind the Biden-Harris ticket by about 10 points. Uh, the Democrats did not lose any of their seats in Texas in the House of Representatives, although a few of them were a little too close for comfort, perhaps, for Democrats. Maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and there was about 10 or so seats in the Texas legislature that Democrats targeted and thought that they might be able to flip to blue, and none of those were able to flip. So the Republican trifecta in Texas, which is Republican control of the governorship, uh, the Texas Senate, and the Texas House of Representatives remains. So my first question for the panel here, and it's kind of a twofold question. 
Uh, what were your expectations going into the election? And you can address any of those levels that I just mentioned. And as a follow-up, were you surprised at all by the final results? So, anyone want to take this question first? So I can take, I can start. Um, <laughs> I, um, I think in this election, I was hopeful as well, especially about congressional districts in Texas. I know that um, in the last few years, straight ticket voting has gone away in Texas, but uh, I know that folks were hopeful that people coming out for Biden, maybe the first time would stick around and vote for Senate and their house, um, house representative. I think that in terms of um, Austin though, when you sort of look at the federal, state and local offices that were on the ballot, it's very clear that it wasn't a situation of not enough people turning out to vote or people voting for Biden and then Cornyn and the Senate and then a representative, a Republican for their representative. The issue is really just gerrymandering. And I think that surprise wouldn't be the word, but just confirmation of disappointment would be the word that I felt with the, the House of Representatives, particularly around Austin, but hopeful at the local level. <laughs> So it was a bit of a dual edged. And, and I, it, it didn't surprise me. I thought there was a lot of voting, uh, voter suppression from the beginning that the Republican administration had been leading up to this particular point by all the different uh, laws and policies that it had instituted that weren't there before as you know, the ID who could vote. Uh, you can no longer, the car didn't represent anymore. Uh, you had to have the Texas driver's license all of these particular barriers that began to, to come up uh, was leading to, besides the gerrymandering also, but there were a lot of different stepping and barriers, especially for people of color or low income communities. Uh, it became tougher and tougher to voting. Here in Austin, we saw it too. We had to challenge, at, we had to challenge the county and the city because the East Austin boxes were not open at 7 a.m they would be having them at the recreation center and not opening to 10 o'clock when by law, everything's supposed to be from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we saw that locally, how even at the local government level, how the voting suppression was happening through the people of color and how long this had been going on uh, before it corrected uh, of having this. And even then we saw with the COVID-19 uh, we had only two um, places that we could vote in certain areas of East Austin. So it was limited, even for East Austin, it was even more limited as to uh, the access to voting uh, in our communities. And so that was the same thing that was happening at the state level. And then the other thing is not that we were voting for Biden and Harris, but we we're voting against Trump. So a lot of the people I know, and I personally myself, my vote was not about Biden and Harris. My vote was more about get Trump the hell out of there, you know? And so that's kind of the, the thing, the way we looked at it. And then here locally, we targeted three precincts that had the lowest turnout. And we targeted them on doing voter registration and then getting out to vote. And we were able to increase those lowest precincts in the whole city of Austin um, by 10% and we increased the voter turnout by 33%. So it was a lot of work and it was due to us getting some additional resources and able to do it because if we didn't get the resources, we wouldn't be able to do it. And I think that that's another uh, tackling block is that um, the Democrats and the foundations have failed to provide resources for the grassroots organizations. But when they do have resources, they can really move the community, even in the time of COVID, uh, to get out and, and vote. So, um, you know, we're glad that Trump, you know, and his cronies are out, but we know that there's a lot of work ahead that we need to be do, need to do uh, for the coming years. I don't have much to add. I, you know, I, I think Shannon and Susanna covered a lot of it, but I'll just say the combination of um, both what we've seen at the Supreme Court really gutting the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act combined with all of these piecemeal voter suppression efforts that have stacked up over time 
uh, has this culminating effect. And I saw that for years working the election. I got deputized as a young scholar with Poder <laughs> many years ago and ended up uh, working elections and over time saw the voter ID laws and uh, you know different rules and regulations. Every once in a while we get a win, like you can vote at any precinct now uh, that used to be very restrictive. Um, but for the most part, that in combination with the redistricting makes it really hard to push change at the state level. And uh, the House uh, majority is a thinner margin, but not, not much. So I will say personally, I was pleasantly surprised that it was a very peaceful election. I was scared. Um, I'll admit there was an undercurrent for me of wondering what could really go down. And I am incredibly grateful that we had a peaceful election. Um, I'm concerned about the implications for state level election law, especially coming out of some of the case around Pennsylvania and things like that. So yeah, that, but I think, I think they summed it up. The, the grassroots effort is absolutely what has to be funded and supported if there's any hope for progressive reform in these Southern states. And you guys bringing up the voter suppression is really important. I think a lot of people who don't live in states like Texas think that or believe that voter suppression is something that is from the past in, in the Jim Crow era that doesn't exist as much today. And we saw it made national headlines, the efforts in Texas to limit ballot, like there's only gonna be one ballot drop off location in Harris County, the same as in Loving County where there's only 300 people living there. And all of that got shot down, but it was through the early voting period, which really uh, limited voting. Um, so, and also the, the, the fact that if Democrats had taken control of the Texas legislature, they could have done something about redrawing districts and removing some of the gerrymandering that, that Brooke pointed out. But I think a lot of the, the hope was that that would change and that, but that didn't really come to pass. So I think that's a good segue into my next question for you guys. And there's a lot of debate going on around right now about whether or not progressive ideas, progressive candidates, and maybe particular slogans that we hear out there on social media uh, were either helpful or harmful to Democratic candidates in this election. Um, and I think in particular in Texas, this debate is often shaped by the rightward shift that we saw in the Rio Grande Valley, um, especially in when it came to voting for Biden or Trump. So I guess my question for you guys is, what is your take on the appeal of progressivism to Texas voters? And how do you think that Democrats can best reach out to the people living in the communities that you guys serve? I, I can start off, oh, go ahead, yeah, I'll, I'll go in reverse order. First. Yeah, um, just, I'll just quickly say, I, I, I don't think slogans are as harmful as lack of engagement with voters on real, economic issues. Racial justice has to be a, realized in this country through a movement that should not be inhibited in any way. And it won't inhibit progressive progress if regular working people are engaged about the issues that they truly care about. So what I notice in Austin is a real divorce between the people who are conscious of the need for police reform, the need for justice, the, the origins of the police, and the financial injustices and inequities there, and a class analysis around particularly things like land use and transportation. Whereas I see land use and transportation progressive advocates, um, or not even progressive, but just more grassroots, more community oriented, who aren't seeing or feeling the pain around the policing issue or who are concerned about their community safety. And so I think, you know, in the spirit of Molly Ivins, because that's who I think of when I think of understanding a lot of Texas politics is, you know, it doesn't run right to left as much as it runs top to bottom. And frankly, a lot of politicians have left their working class people in the dust. Uh, but especially in Texas where people, a lot of people are just getting by and don't want the government to get in the way. Um, it, it's not resonating until you start talking about real life issues with people like healthcare and basic needs in schools. So I, I think that's what's been absent. I think Susanna hit on it. It's the grassroots groups that are in relationship with regular folks have to be where the rubber meets the road, I think, in terms of political momentum. Yeah. And, I, and I'll just follow that because um, I think that the Democratic Party has done a very poor job. It has a long standing history of itself of inequities and racism itself and not supporting 
Latinos or even African-American candidates who in the past have run and have not gotten their fair share of the resources also. And the Democratic Party has missed the grassroots completely. And we saw that in this presidential race that it was people of color that really selected Biden and Harris or who went against Trump and voted for Biden. It was people of color that put them in office if you look at, at the whole nation of what, what happened. But, and a lot of the resources and how the Democratic uh, at the national level had to reach out to the African-American community and to the Latino community and to some of the indigenous native uh, lands too, uh, to get the people out to vote. Uh, and I think because there was so much um, uh, disappointment and anger at, at the Trump uh, presidency and his, and his followers, that uh, it was a right time too, that people of color just were like, this has got to change. Um, people were actually, you know, uh, the racism was just so high uh, by the Trump administration that the backlash was that people of color had to come out and vote because it was a matter of survival for us. And I think that the Democratic Party feels like, like um, Armin was saying, what are the real basic issues in the communities? You know, housing, uh, access to health care, uh, food security, all of these different issues are real important economics and education. And a lot of the time we don't hear those things being discussed, uh, especially at the state level or the democratic level. I think this was the first time that I, I even heard uh, Hager who was running talked about equity and, and talked about social justice and racism, which I was really blown away about. Uh, actually, uh, people were talking about these particular uh, issues. Uh, but I think that if we're going to change, if we're really going to change um, Texas to be a democratic state, more resources, uh, it has to be uh, brought down to communities of color and grassroots and low income communities, because that's where change is really going to happen. It has to happen from the bottom up and not from the top down. And I think the Democratic Party has really missed, missed that uh, opening and how grassroots people really function. Yeah, I agree. I think in terms of like the hindsight is really interesting with political science in this, um, in this question in particular, because beforehand it was all about the suburbs and the educated white women of the suburbs who are going to betray the Republican Party and they're going to come out full force Democrat. And then after the election, it's like, what's the deal with these Mexican Americans in the Rio Grande Valley? And why did they underperform for Biden? And I think that it's so fascinating because the political science of it has so often split Latinos as a category, um, sort of from Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and then everybody else. And I think that it's really impossible to categorize in terms of preferences in general from Latinos in the Rio Grande Valley with Latinos in Los Angeles, but it's because we do it in the guise of party politics. Like Carmen and Susana were saying, it's so much about issues and talking to working people about education and healthcare and um, jobs and like unionizing and worker power and stuff is really, I think the where the power is going to come from and where any type of like loyalty to a party or an idea will come from. So, so not to, you know, go too far into the Rio Grande Valley, but I think, you know, it's important to talk about since it's all over social media and the news is what, how do you think that, that and you kind of already said it, how do you think Democrats failed to engage voters in that part of the country? Okay. I, I just want to follow up with Brooks there, because I think that uh, I kept hearing this in the media about, again, the Latinos and, and in the Rio Grande, but not hearing about the white women in the suburbs and not hearing about the white men and how they voted and why they voted that way, because they wanted to keep the same status quo. The white women in the suburbs were afraid of, wait, we still want our children to have that upper level 
of hierarchy in the community. And they didn't want to lose that status quo, neither did the white man. The white man felt challenged. And so I think a lot of the time, instead of steering it towards the Latino community and why they didn't or didn't, here you got more of a homogeneous white people who didn't do what they needed to do because they wanted to uh, reserve that status quo, that hierarchy, um, the whole prejudice, racism, inequity kind of system. And they were willing to go against their own principles because they wanted to keep that in place. And I think that that's really where the discussion should be and not for a small majority of Latinos in the Valley, but statewide of why white people uh, voted for Trump. Yeah, I think we also need to, I, I wasn't aware until I really started talking to people about this issue during election season, how much proactive uh, recruitment there was of Latino voters in South Texas and border areas for Trump and, and Republicans in general. Um, oftentimes on the single issue of abortion and oftentimes promoted through religious networks. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you just from my own family experience, when you have especially elder um, members of the family who, for whom English is not their first language, they are relying on people in that they trust to tell them who they should vote for. If they are recent citizens or if they've gained citizenship, but they don't really follow the same politics, and so that absence, that vacuum of engagement, that taking for granted that, people, that Latinos in South Texas and Latinos will vote for the Democratic Party, um, which is, by the way, a lot of Mexican Americans and multi-generational people who have been engaged in the system for a long time, leaves out a lot of people who are just waiting for some direction. And I heard of people's aunts and mothers getting robocalls and calls from their own friends and fellow parishioners and people who you know were telling them you have to do this this is the most important thing um and i mean not to be so gendered but in a lot of places that's true and also you have this very like entrepreneurial sp spirit of people who you know have assimilated what it means to be successful in corporate america and i think we can't um underestimate the influence of those things so I think, you know, it's an absence and a, and a combination of serious efforts to, to swing things uh, back into the deep red in, in the South Texas. Yeah, I think Carmen really, you hit the nail on the head in that because Latinos are often compared to African-Americans in terms of especially voter turnout and like what matters to them. And Latinos have by and large the Catholic church, but the, the tradition isn't there of like the organizing and the social gospel of the black church to where it's like easier to co-opt for Republicans and um, like single issue voters with uh, women's rights and stuff to really galvanize folks against that without like a social policy or a social gospel message in this way coming out to like unify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to tell you a quick little uh, story. Uh, when I was young, and I, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and, and I'm a, come from a family of 10, and I remember when Kennedy was running, okay, I was just a teenager, the church was very much involved. Actually, actually, all the priests were handing out pictures of John F. Kennedy and asking all the parishioners to put John F. Kennedy on our altar and pray for him, and, and that's why you got a big turnout, you know, from the Latino and those involved in the Catholic Church. Again, at that time, the Catholic Church is very strong. Now people have gone to different denominations, but I think so too that the Catholic Church, there was no say about Biden being Catholic. You know, the church was not involved in giving out pictures and say, hey, put Biden on your altar and pray because he's Catholic. It was sort of like this quiet atmosphere and it was definitely what Carmen said, they zeroed in on the whole abortion issue, you know, the women's right, what was happening to the children. And this was a, a, almost across various different uh, faiths and religion, not just, not just the Catholics, uh, that this was happening. Uh, and so they were looking at tunnel vision and not even looking at all the different things that um, the Trump administration, the devastation that they were causing. So I guess the question is then, how do 
Democrats fix this problem? And I know you mentioned funding the grassroots, but do you, can you go in a little bit more of the specifics? Like if you were put in charge of the, the Democratic Party's efforts to make flip the state blue, blue to get the Texas legislature control, what would be your strategy? Well, you know, it would be like anything you do at the grassroots level. You have to make sure uh, that you bring everybody to the table. You know, there are established neighborhood groups in every community. And so you have to make sure that you um, are talking with the, with the different neighborhood groups and that you're starting a relationship. This thing about just dropping in during election time is that's got to change. And that's what people say. I always run into people and, and you know, they tell me, oh, no más vienen con las elecciones. They only come when it's election time. Where is that relationship building uh, with the communities? With, you know, there's various leaders, whether there's leaders in PTAs, there are leaders in different religions, there are leaders at the neighborhood group, there are leaders in businesses. So there are all of these different uh, people that work into the community and they're not being consulted. They're not being asked to come to the table by the Democratic Party has taken advantage and had gotten so used to that people of color were just going to come to a jump on the bandwagon where a lot of people decided uh, not that they were going to the other party, but they just weren't going to participate. And because of lack of candidates. People were also saying, hey, who are the candidates that are you're running? Why don't we have candidates that reflect us running in the Democratic Party? And so all of these things played a role in how the Democratic Party needs to get involved at the grassroots level and needs to build that base at the grassroots level and then network with all the different counties, all the different cities, and then you network statewide. You know, those, that's how uh, grassroots groups do. They organize at local level, they then network with other groups, and then they go at the state level and network, and then they go uh, through south, Southwest regions, Northeast regions, Central regions, and they organize nationally and, and then internationally. And I think the Democratic Party just needs to follow the, um, the playbook and the principles of environmental justice that are there and the humanist principles. And I think that there'll be a big change then. Okay, well, do you wanna- Oh, I was just gonna chime in. I mean, I think, I do think Susanna uh, spoke to all of it, but I'll just add that I hope that this pandemic and this year has really shown uh, that the people closest to regular folks who are living the experience and the people who are actually dealing with the problems are closest to the solutions. Um, we saw grassroots groups get funded in, in some cases in ways that we'd never gotten funded before um, because we actually had a relationship with people who were really hurting and needed help and needed engagement in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and it's because of the relationships, it's because of the trust, uh, it takes time. And I hope that in this election, watching Georgia, watching Michigan, watching Arizona, that um, that the Democratic Party and others are are seeing where their where their money really goes a lot long a, a lot further. Great, uh, and I do want to spend a little time talking about about the pandemic now that you've brought it up. Uh, so we, we do have vaccines or, or multiple vaccines on the horizon now, uh, but many parts of the country are going through the worst part of the pandemic that we've seen so far. So I'd like to ask you guys, what's happening in your communities uh, in regards to the pandemic that people need to know more about and what can policy leaders, whether that's the state, federal or locally, what can they do about these things that are going on? Well, I'll let Carmen because her community right now is number one and not in a good stage. Uh, they're number one in the COVID uh, positive testing and so forth. Yeah, GAVA organizes a lot in Dove Springs and Southeast Austin. That's the first area where we um, came together as a coalition and of course um, plugged into a lot of longstanding efforts by longtime community members. It's not my neighborhood, but I've been honored to work with them for over a decade. Um, and it's the community that's been hardest hit 
by a lot of inequities, um, also hardest hit by flooding in a lot of cases um, and climate injustices, not just from climate change, but from inequitable development and land use and all of those things. Um, and also has very, very disproportionately high um, underlying health risks, high rates of diabetes and, and hypertension and other um, chronic conditions that can create a big risk and also a huge working class population, uh, essential workers, people who are on the front lines uh, and people who are incredibly rich in community because they have, uh, they have a multi-generational thriving neighborhood uh, that often gets described in ways that are really, you know, just about the worst of the worst. When we could look at any community and dig out the worst of the worst, it doesn't matter how many resources they have, right? Um, but these folks are are rich in community. Um, but because of so many factors, because people live together, because people have had to double up and triple up in the housing, um, because people have to go to work, uh, because the safety nets are not designed to, to help people in this kind of crisis, uh, the exposure has been the highest. The hospitalization and positivity rate has been some of the highest neck and neck in zip codes. And we see this all over the city, right? There's hot spots for COVID, uh, but it is devastating people. It's taking family members, um, sometimes multiple family members, uh, and it's creating new chronic um, health issues. And then beyond that is probably what's most acutely felt by most people um, who are impacted by COVID, which is the economic toll. So it, it has been um, it has been devastating. It has also been incredibly um, validating and inspiring to watch people take care of each other where our systems fail, and to see how uh, a connected and stable community with longtime neighbors is the most resilient community. Um, it, it, it is is bringing home so many of these issues. Um, and so it's been devastating and it's been inspiring. Um, but this is, uh, yeah, it's it's been acutely felt like in many parts of the country. And I'll follow with, uh, I'll follow that up and I just wanna give out some of the stats and this is in, in the latest in week 47, a while Latinos represent 35% of the Austin population uh, Latinos make up 35% of the hospitalization, 46% of the COVID cases, and 48% of the deaths. And those zip codes that have the highest amount in all of these uh, categories that I just mentioned is 78741 is the community in which I live in Montopolis, uh, 78753, which is the Eastern Crescent uh, considered, and of course 78744 where you just heard uh, Carmen talk about uh, GABA and its work. And, and you know, when the whole COVID uh, broke out, we, um, this was March and then April, and we saw the lack of response uh, by the city and the county and the state and saw people walking around without masks and not really knowing uh, what was doing, what was happening and what they should be doing. So we took it upon ourselves to start giving out masks and giving out information that was for them, giving it out not till, and it wasn't uh, until um, July that we got some of the rise money to be able to purchase, uh, you know, sanitizers and masks um, and, you know, the PPE that was needed. And we had to put together our own brochures and we a lot of the education that had to happen. Uh, all of this um, was the grassroots community again, taking on that leadership and going out and not just popping our trunk and telling people to drive through, but actually we were going to all the different hot spots where we knew that, or like Carmen said, where families were living together, multiple families, we targeted all the apartments that you know, had vulture, vouchers, uh, were low income, the mobile home parks, uh, the homeless camp, and made sure that people got the uh, PPE and information that they needed connected them to resources. But it was uh, the Austin Latino Coalition. Uh, uh, that is a coalition of all different Latinos uh, from uh, business, nonprofits, uh, people who just really cared, who began to put the pressure on the city and the county about 
why weren't they doing the testing? Uh, why weren't they monitoring? Uh, it was them putting on the pressure that, hey, you've got to provide funding at the grassroots uh, of what's really happening in our communities. And by that time, it was pretty much, you know, Montapas was number one all the way, I believe, until uh, July in the cases. And then it, it jumped over to uh, Dove Springs. And it's like Carmen said, uh, we have the most essential workers, most people who are not covered by health care, uh, multi generational people living uh, together. Uh, it was like the perfect storm already, people who are already economically disadvantaged and then being hit by the COVID, it really brought forth the inequities and the injustice that people of color and low income people have been living on in all time, were not able to pay their rent, you know. And then let's not even mention the education, what was happening to families when the schools were closing. And then we have to talk about the digital divide how then you were supposed to get at the beginning before even computer access was handed out to the students was everybody was having to get on the phone to do their homework. And not just that, it was like a lot of people were on family plans so they didn't have all the data that they needed to be even doing their homework. Uh, later we found out 70% of AISD students were failing because we couldn't expect parents who had limited education and in Montapas, the majority only have a ninth grade then to be working with their students or still having to work and have four or five kids at home and then having to do their homework uh, online without computer access. So when we looked at all of these issues, we, we saw the, the big digital divide because all the services say, go to the internet, go to the internet without providing a phone number for people who did not have internet access or did not know how to navigate the internet to just call and get somebody online to help them. We, we saw so many issues in our community. And I think now going to the vaccine, there's another big inequity and issue that I see because the way from the federal level going down saying, okay, who is the first to get it? You know, the health workers, I understand that completely, the ambulance, all those emergency workers, than the elderly, but I think what they really need to be doing is targeting those zip codes, those neighborhoods where they know has the highest amount of COVID and deaths, and that those communities should be the first in line to get the vaccine. Not you're going to go around everybody, and again, those communities that have taken on the burden, that have taken on the loss, are not being targeted as the number one communities to get the vaccine, they're creating another status as to who gets uh, the vaccine instead of going where the, where the problem is the most, and they know it, it's all data is collected and making sure that those neighborhoods are the first to get the vaccine. So there's another big issue that I really see that we need to uh, address and not just here, it's throughout the United States. They're following that same thing, even though they know in Chicago, they know in California where those hot spots are at, and they're using an entire different um, formula uh, in getting out the vaccine. Yeah, so you bring up something that I definitely wanted to talk about, and I think it came up in my conversation with both. You, Susana, and Carmen last summer when I wrote a piece on the inequities of, of coronavirus's impact on Austin. And there's this idea of the digital divide. And Austin has this reputation as being a tech hub. You know, it's the home of South by Southwest. And now in the news just tonight, Oracle is going to relocate to Austin. But there's just this normal, enormous digital divide where I think, Susana, you explained to me that um, back in the early stages of the pandemic, in order to go get a COVID test, you needed an email address in order to do that. And so many people in East Austin, in these zip codes that coronavirus was having its worst impact, so many people did not have an email address, which is something that so many Americans and so many Austinites especially take for granted. Um, so do you have any comments about the digital divide? Any of you that you want to expand a little bit so people can hear about that? Yeah, and, and actually that that was one of the problems that we brought up uh, at the Latino Health Coal, the Austin Latino Coalition, because what I found out personally 
is I was on there and I had to get the email to navigate to set an appointment, right? And then you would look at the date and you would click on that date and say, oh, it's full. Then you go the next day, oh, it's full. Instead of just going, here are the dates that are available and setting up a system like that, you have to keep on clicking until you got to a date where there was availability. But when I try to sign up my son and other people, it says, no, you can't use the same email. So even people were calling me and saying, could you help me navigate and get me? I said, we're gonna to have to not create a whole email for you because the system would not let me register other people. So that system was really messed up. And that was a city system of people uh, trying to get on. And like I said, we surveyed people, 60% of the people did not have email addresses. Not only that, this is another problem we saw. The libraries and the recreation centers were where you had free internet access. Well, during COVID, they all closed down. So they locked out all these people who could go and get free internet access. They all of a sudden were locked out of getting uh, internet access. Not only that, at the beginning, the clinics closed down. How stupid is that? The clinics in the neighborhoods closed down instead of brainstorming, okay, how do we do it? Which they later did. It took them three or four months to figure out, okay, let's just change the system, the entrance, let's do all of this stuff. But they actually closed down. So where were people going to get access? The testing sites, in the, living in Matapas, had to go all the way to St. John's. Just imagine someone who didn't have a vehicle and, and then having to try and get online to make an appointment. And, and the communities that had the most high COVID, there was no testing sites in our communities. There were none in Mantapas, there were none in, in Dove Springs. It took them until September to open up a place for people to do testing. These are all issues that when you have professional people that are not talking with people at the grassroots, they are not helping the solution. They're not. If they don't have that relationship and don't understand on the ground what is really happening, then this is what happened. You have more COVID cases. You have more deaths. All of these things are happening. And I think that, uh, and I'm hoping that there are now, when the next thing comes along, is that they are very more prepared, that they have listened to the grassroots community as to the things that they need to do. But they also need to provide free internet service. The city of Austin put together money with the chambers of them. And in three parks, all in West Austin, there's free Wi-Fi. There's free Wi-Fi. Now, all they have to do is look at the census data, look at the places where there's COVID, and they should be providing free Wi-Fi for the community so that they can do have access. But the other thing is they have to do education because a lot of the things we found out that a lot of the parents didn't know how to navigate the internet. They had to rely on their children but they themselves didn't know how to navigate the internet. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done to close this digital divide is how do we create these programs? So when the next pandemic or problem comes, how do we make sure that uh, low income and people of color are connected and that they know how to navigate because everything is go to the internet, go to the internet. And there's definitely still a digital divide. Yeah, I think something that's very clear all over the country is that these levels of inequity are extremely clear when we're talking about kids and education. How you see pictures in the newspaper from Austin, from New York, right? Like students sitting outside of a McDonald's in the back next to the dumpster with their laptops and, and textbooks and stuff. And um, I heard recently, you know, a podcast about education equity and thinking about the the like missed opportunities that government had at every single level to do creative solutions where all these auditoriums these sports venues these like these large spaces were vacant and it would be so easy to get kids there socially distanced to sort of pick up packets to do things like this um in the 40s there there was um a bad flu outbreak in chicago and what they did was create a public radio station 
so that every hour there would be a lesson at every level of school. So the kids would tune in for an hour. And that was the birth of WBEZ in Chicago. Um, and so these types of creative solutions, it feels like that we're so inspired by historical events, like in the midst of a crisis, these folks rose to the moment. It just seems like that's it's lacking at nearly every level of government in nearly every city. So I think this might be a good time to bring up your P, uh, your wonderful six part piece that you just did for us this week, Brooke, and you guys can go see that on urbanitus.com. Uh, the series is called The Progressive Paradox, Austin's Enduring Dilemma. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and kind of the solution or the conclusions you came to and maybe how some of those conclusions could help alleviate some of the things that we've talked about this evening. Sure. So the progressive paradox is really about how Austin city government invested full tilt in the reforms of the progressive era. The first progressive era was from the 1890s through the 1920s, and it brought things that we now associate with city governments everywhere. Um, but there are things like at large city councils, nonpartisan elections, city managers sort of taking the politics out of government at the city level. In reaction to cities like New York and Chicago, that were really led by party bosses, party machines, things like that, that were notoriously corrupt and uh, used nepotism and violence to, to get services done. So it's like the expansion of the city service, state building at the local level. Um, we see these things play out uh, over time in Austin, right? Through this like development of, um, of this character that sort of neither here nor there with the city government, which really stayed at this um, early progressive structure and really maintained its, its uh, system throughout the 20th century. And there's been this like growing conflict with the government in Austin and the, the city in which it governs that first of all, there's way too small of a city council for most of 20, the 20th century from four to six counselors governing like hundreds of thousands of people. It's just unresponsive. Um, and then so when crises like this appear, um, at first glance, it seems like it would be smart to just give all the power to a very small number of people or one person in a strong mayor system. But in reality, the way that it most often works is that it's, it results in better, more robust policy that's representative, representative of larger swaths of the community when there are representatives from those swaths of the community in government that actually have power. So the argument of the progressive paradox as a way to sort of get past it is um, to represent everyone in Austin and represent the historically excluded communities that were excluded on purpose <laughs> by the city government over time in order to, to forge a, a new progressive era, a second progressive era in American politics, which takes those lessons of the first one of good governance of, you know, political bosses are bad, nepotism is bad, but including equality, including equity for communities that were um, explicitly removed from city government and representation. So when you say this this character, you mean that, that Austin has this character of being progressive, but that the way that it's governed doesn't really, doesn't really demonstrate that. Exactly, sort of like the mythos of Austin that has been created over over decades and over movies and songs and things like that, right? And the Save Our Springs movement, which um, Susanna literally wrote the books on. So um, thinking about how the city's like public face developed over time, sort of no thanks to its government and how um, Austin is now known as, a, known as a smart city, like you said, with a really big tech industry luring tech folks in the creative class from all over the country, but um, not really putting that back in to the city around it. Um, with all of these tech places with Google and Apple and things like that, it seems like it would be a no brainer. It seems like it would be very easy, in fact, to implement a universal Wi-Fi, a smart city model in Austin. Um, but why hasn't it happened? Okay, so I, one other thing I think we should talk about from the 2020 election, especially in Austin, is Proposition A passing, which is going to provide a new uh, network of transit all throughout the city. And I would just like to get each of your takes on the Project Connect and if you think it really will serve your communities and the city the way that it should. If I can maybe um, piggyback on one of the last things Brooke said and just kind of segue 
one of the things that I've been really thinking about a lot in terms of Austin's growth and development and these inherent inequities in many of the large plans and developments um, is an issue of value capture. It's an issue of um, how capital is invested <clears throat> and, and the parties that invest and, um, and the way that people and culture and particularly people of color uh, and artists and educators and the sort of diverse people that uh, live in Austin are commodified. Culture is commodified and it becomes a part of the investment. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because the financing mechanism in the city of Austin uh, has pitted very core values against each other. So the way that we pay for most of the things that we need is by maxing out our credit card on these general obligation bonds or voting for tax increases like we saw in Prop A uh, that are very expensive that require, um, well, they do two things. First of all, they require that the people who are already here pay a lot to build out for the people who are moving here. And um, they also create a consistent pressure on our leadership to grow the tax base. Uh, you can grow the tax base by taking new areas and building more stuff out there, which they do. And you can, you can build the tax base by kicking out people who don't make enough money and bringing in high income earner earners. And that's what the tech boom has, has done. So I think the, the caveat with Project Connect which could be a really great transportation plan and is gonna have costs and benefits no matter what, is that the financing mechanism for the whole thing and the context of Austin's previous decisions, which have just been completely racist and classist again and again, means that the people paying aren't the people receiving the benefits and the people who need transit the most are not being centered. And I can tell you that in theory, Project Connect and Prop A sounded great, but for the communities that I work in, many, many working class people of color were devastated about this decision. Now, devastated. For me to hear that word used about a transit decision, uh, and, and you think, how could it be? It's not that they're against transit, it's that their neighborhoods aren't slated to be improved for 10 to 20 years. They can barely afford their taxes now or their rents. And in some cases, Capital Metro has come in and said, we're taking your bus stop away. It's going to the domain in some of our North Austin neighborhoods while also saying you need to vote for this so we can pay for better transit. So there are foundational root cause issues that are screwing up the whole thing. Uh, but if we don't look at that context as we're really looking at impact, we're gonna miss the mark again and again. And we can subsidize the growth of a city that you know, working class people don't get to enjoy. And I'll follow up with that, how we saw it. And I'm one of those persons that was very devastated by it. Uh, because when I looked in, in 2010, how they prepared for rail to come up East Riverside Drive, and I did a research project on it, um, they had to come up with the East Riverside Corridor plan that started east of I-35 and went all the way to the airport through our community in Metropolis. In order to um, make way for rail, over 2,000 people were displaced. Displaced just along that short corridor because the vision of rail coming down East Riverside. And what they replaced it with, they got rid of all, just about all the affordable housing. There's, there's a few projects left, very many, I think maybe two left along that corridor. All the rest have been erased and replaced with high income apartments uh, where no low income or working class person can live there. Not only did they displace the people, but in some of those tracks where the Oracle is at, it had a 400% increase of whites. So not only did they remove the low income working class people who would use transit, they, they also made sure and got rid of all the people of color from that corridor. And what you have now is choice riders along that corridor. 
you have people who have the chores, they can jump in their car, or they can uh, take the bus, which they rarely do. Uh, but you have people who have no choice but to ride transit. And it's like uh, uh, Carmen said, they're having to walk further now. You know, all the people who lived along Vargas, uh, Vita Street in my community, that whole line went away. And there's only one transit corridor, which is Montaplas Drive. So women with children and handicapped have to travel a long distance just to catch the bus. Not only that, but the bus is, is constantly going up in price, even though they're compared with other cities and states. And they say, oh, we're still way belong, but they don't look at who are they comparing it with? Are you comparing it with people who are working at $8 or minimum wage or just barely above minimum wage where they're having to pay 70% of their income for transportation and housing and not be able to have any income left? And we saw when the other rail has come in, it's $7 to write that rail. $7 to write the rail that comes from west to part of east. And when low income and working class people can't afford to get on that rail. So again, how do we make sure that we address the inequities that like, like Carmen said, who is it really gonna benefit? You know, when it comes here, does that mean that by that time it comes here, all the low income working class and people of color would have already been displaced when the new rail system comes in 10 to 20 uh, years? And then we're getting a 25% increase on our property taxes when we're already being gentrified and displaced, where taxes are already driving us out because they're building $380,000 homes in a 33% poverty community. So, uh, pro you know, Project A, Project Connect, Proposition A was a devastation uh, for many communities of color. And one that's not gonna benefit us, even when we look at, I'm gonna to try to get on uh, the, they, they're putting out two committees to uh, look at that. And one is uh, the Transit Partnership Committee, which is pretty political. It's gonna make uh, three seats by capital method, three by the city, uh, and, uh, and then only three community people on there. And then when you look at the community uh, committee, uh, it's only going to be uh, seven people, I believe, on there, and they will only have recommendations. But I tell you, we need to have people who will look at equity and justice on both of these committees, because that funding will be squandered in ways that it's not supposed to. If 300 million there is for displacement and gentrification, it needs to start now. It needs to make sure that those affordable apartments that are there are maintained for 99 years and not being sold off for making the transition. And it makes to make sure that they build more low income and affordable housing right now along the corridor because those will be the real transit riders. And so I, I think that this, again, um, that's why we were so devastated by this particular um, a proposition, and I know that they try to throw in something for everybody to get them to come aboard and vote for it, but it was very narrow-minded. Okay, well, we are just about out of time. It is almost 7 p.m. Central here, so I want to thank our panelists for joining and everybody who watched on Facebook. Uh, remember, you can find more at urbanitus.com or facebook.com slash urbanitus or Bonitus Austin on Twitter and Instagram. So again, thank you everybody who came in and listened and thank you to our panelists and we will see you next time. Thank you.